Uh, again, this gets to the context of the adventure, right? You want to build that up some. So when they finally get to the bad guy or the mini boss or whatever it is, they have some context to put it in. They have a, more of a relationship with them. And ideally, the players, rather than the characters, hate you, right? If you can motivate the players to go into the dungeon or look for the treasure or kill the bad guy, you've done substantially great work as a DM or designer, more so than just motivating the characters. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm here with Bryce Lynch, who runs 10footpole.org, which is the de facto adventure critique and uh, review site, I would say, in the uh, Dungeons and Dragons world. And with me today is Bryce Lynch. So th welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. So Bryce, I mean, you've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, you've, your uh, blog uh, website is a go-to place to learn about adventure design, but how did you actually start getting into uh, role-playing games in the first place? So I guess it was like 1978. My sister took me to some place, uh, a game store, it turns out, uh, and they were playing Dungeons & Dragons on a table in the room next door. Uh, in retrospect, I think she was there to buy pot and didn't give a shit about anything else. <laughs> Uh, but I was certainly enraptured by the giant piece of poster board covered in newspaper, and they were cutting out little sections with an X-Acto knife as the party's torch moved along. Uh, it was great. So uh, I think I got the whole set maybe for Christmas that year and went from there. And what set was that? Was that like the Red Box era? No, that would have been... Prior to that, uh, so it wasn't Red Box and it wasn't Moldve, which was the edition before that. This would have been Holmes, which was like a light blue color. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. very early. And so, how how did you go from like you played? I'm assuming with friends, and uh, were you always like the GM? Was was that kind of your role? Absolutely, always the DM. So uh, now that I'm older. Well, obviously, I've played a little bit as a player. But now that I'm older, I play a little bit more as a player as um, other people want to DM, uh, but particularly games that I'm most invested in. Um, but for the core D&D experience, I'm still the dungeon master. And were you able to maintain that? Because I know, like, even for myself, you know, you hit your 20s and you start being interested in other things and life gets in the way. But have you been playing consistently that whole time? So role-playing games, absolutely. Uh, so I've been playing role-playing games consistently. Uh, but, of course, I switched around systems, right? So the 90s, Vampire gets popular. Uh, and then GURPS, a little bit of GURPS around that time. A foray into uh, kind of the indie small press RPG scene. Uh, and then that led me to my realization and then back to d and in, I don't know, the early 2000s, mid 2000s, sometime around there. And when was the uh, moment that you said, hey, I'm gonna review some games or did the blog start kind of in a different fashion? No, that's absolutely um, kind of the way it was. So I get back from indie RPGs back into d and this is the very early days of the OSR, I think, and um, or the earlier days of the OSR. Uh, and I look online for some resources, of course, and find some forums and some blogs and find some recommended adventures. You know, uh, I go to Gen Con that year and I drop, I don't know, $1,500 on adventure modules, OSR wow. adventure modules. Super excited. Everybody says these adventures are great. Crack them open and they're just utter garbage. Just, just absolutely terrible adventures. And I'm like, well, this fucking sucks. So uh, I decide to take some notes. And then I decide, well, if I'm taking notes, like I can publish my notes, right? So that's where the blog starts. It's essentially my notes on the adventures I read and what makes them good and what makes them bad. And for those that probably don't understand it, like, did you discover like the name on your own or how did that kind of nugget come out? Oh. Boy, that's a really good 
question. I don't remember how I came up with <laughs> Like maybe wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole, maybe. Or looking for traps or like. Yeah, right. I kind of like the idea of poking something to see yeah. if it's any good or not, right? <laughs> uh, but boy, I couldn't tell you the origin of the name. Of it. We'll make one up. Okay. Yeah, poking stuff to see. Poking stuff. There you go. <laughs> And uh, so when when you think about your aesthetic for how you review adventures and what you like and what you don't like, I mean, I have seen you are pr pretty harsh on adventures and I think people really appreciate it because you don't hold back. And so w when you approach it for the first time, when you see an adventure, like what kind of like, what's your first gut reaction of like, this is garbage and do you flip through it? How, what's your process? So, uh, I will tell you, I'm always super excited when I see an adventure. Uh, I am a sucker for marketing. I'm a sucker for the cover. Uh, I'm an optimist. Uh, and of course, you can't be a bitter pessimist without being a wonderful optimist, right? <laughs> you that great divide to fall from. Uh, so I'm always super interested and super optimistic going into these things. Um, and then, you know, things start in the marketing blurb, like it's a race against time is always a good keyword that, boy, this is gonna suck. Or a 15 page fiction piece up front. Uh, somebody devoted a little too much time to something besides the adventure. Um, so there are some things that kind of lead me into a negative headspace early on, but I try my best to say uh, positive, particularly as I, start an adventure. And what's your criteria? I know uh, sometimes people recommend them on your blog. And then I think you have a thing where you only buy it yourself. You don't actually right. re receive free copies or there's no, there's no influence over you, right? <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, from multiple aspects. So uh, everything I review, I buy. Um, I think there is, and this gets to kind of my entry, there is this tendency for people not to badmouth others who they interact with on a frequent basis. So you see, OSR crowd's relatively small. You interact with these people on a forum. They publish a new adventure. You review the adventure. You gotta live with this guy for the next 10 years on the forums, right? So you don't badmouth it. Well, I don't do that, right? I'm never gonna see these people. I don't really, I don't wanna say not care, right? But you have to keep your distance a little bit as a reviewer. Uh, so I buy everything. There's absolutely no influence off over me. And, you know, we've all got an addiction when it comes to RPGs. <laughs> I'm going to buy RPG stuff anyway. I might as well spend a few bucks on an adventure module. So it's not like this is additional money coming out of my pocket. I'm just not buying the new 5th edition thing or the new GURPS thing. Um, so I generally... Uh, solicit or accept, I should say, uh, recommendations from people. So they will say, hey, here's this thing, go review it. I keep an eye out on the forums, particularly the new releases uh, on many of the OSR forums and some of the discords. I watch other people's blogs for new products coming out, Milan and Prince of Nothing, um, both great places to look for alternatives to me, um, and watch drive through a lot. Uh, to see what's new in the OSR category. Pick one and off I go. And how many do you uh, get through a week? Like, do you have like a, your own kind of internal schedule that you like to keep up? So theoretically, I do one on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. What that actually means though, is that it takes me one day and Tuesday to do one, and then Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday to do another, and Friday, Saturday to do the third. Um, and then Sunday is a catch up day. Right. So uh, when I miss one of the other days, I use that. So it generally takes me about two days to get through them. Um, and theoretically, I'm doing three a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But it never works out that way. And I noticed, like, obviously, we'll talk about it later on. We'll uh, have your Patreon link um, and obviously your uh, blog site and uh, your forum. But um, tell us about, like, the Patreon uh, part of it do people get extra reviews or anything through the patreon 
they get something very special. I completely ignore them, except when drunk and drunk posting on it. So as a Patreon, <laughs> I promise you, I will not send you spam messages or send you or pay attention to you in any way, except when I'm out drinking at the bar, and then I will put something dumb up. <laughs> so, so basically, it's people that appreciate your take on these adventures, and they want to help out in your your mission to tell people what's what when it comes to adventures. That's exactly right. So they're helping support me buying adventures, the cost to run the website, and of course, the liquor it takes and in assets to combat that. <laughs> They're greatly appreciated. I love every one of them. I always feel guilty, like I should do something for them. I think I sent them Christmas cards last year, maybe. I don't know. This year, I don't know. Well, I, I know you have a, bu a bunch of fans. Everybody loves your blog, and they love your wit and your, uh, uh, I wouldn't, maybe sarcasm, but that's not <laughs> quite capturing it. But you do a really good job of like poking fun at some of the idiosyncrasies of uh, adventure design. So with that said, I have a list of your tips, and I was hoping that we could kind of go through them and you could expand upon, I'll, I'll lead you in with it, and then uh, we can expand upon what your concept or why you think it's a good idea. So the first one is, an overland portion of the adventure is nice, but not required. Yeah, um, so these are kind of some older tips that I still keep going to my sidebar. And I think what I mean here by an overland portion is some context that the adventure sits in. So rather than just you're standing outside the cave and in you go, let's instead use the preamble to the dungeon or whatever the main adventure is to kind of set the mood, to insert some omens or some foreshadowing or something to kind of get the players out of their day-to-day -day lives and into a D&D &D time, which is going to happen now. Um, sometimes I make an analogy to this to the line cues at Disney and other theme parks where they will theme the line cue to try to get you into the mood to ride the ride, right? And it's the same sort of thing. You want to change the context. And so an overlaying portion of the adventure, a town portion, something up front helps provide that context before you actually get to the main dungeon. Not required, certainly. Uh, sometimes an adventuring site is just an adventuring site, but I think it does help quite a bit. Okay, uh, next one down. Uh, wandering monster tables are generally required. So in an OSR game in particular, right, you're looking at maybe a gold for XP game uh, and wandering monster tables serve a very specific purpose. They're there to, as a timer, as push your luck mechanism to keep the party moving along. Uh, and so you want a wandering monster table to provide that. Otherwise, you have the infinite time problem for the dungeon, right? I'll just hire 10,000 dudes They'll dig the thing out and we'll flood it with water. We'll quit later, right? Why not do that? That seems like a safe thing to do. Well, there's wandering monsters that show up in each of miners, right? So these sorts of wandering monster tables, um, I think it's a good example of understanding how old school mechanics all fit together cohesively and holistically to provide a unique experience that some other game systems don't. And then leading into that, uh, the mo wandering monsters should have a purpose. Sure. Um, so I think as a DM, you have a lot of responsibilities at the table. And just having 1d6 spiders show up is this weird thing where you then have to come up with what are they doing? Do they just drop down on the party or what? Generally, though, I think a human's imagination works best when you're given just a little bit of information more, and then your brain attaches to that and springs off into a new direction. So they are spinning a web or they're dragging somebody up down a hallway or something, right? Just a little bit more, a few extra words gives the DM's imagination something to latch onto and then springboard that into the party and the characters and the context. Without that, You've got the whole, you know, anything is possible, which means you go blind. Uh, next one down is uh, dungeon maps should have lots of loops. No. Oh, so this is uh, Gabor Lux's uh, famous loop design article. Um, it, what we're talking about in old school adventures generally 
particularly with dungeon adventures, are exploratory adventures. Um, and in an exploratory adventure, there has to be a little bit of room to allow for loops on the map. Um, this allows the party to ambush and be ambushed, monsters to circle around, alternative paths to be taken around obstacles, and so on. Um, and it provides a substantially different experience than just a linear adventure. You never know what could be coming down that side hallway that you passed, right? And it always leaves you a little scared, which is a good thing in an OSR game. Or I would say any game, but... And what's your view on uh, five-room dungeons, like the, that whole concept? <laughs> um, so this is really kind of a modern sort of take. And I think modern fantasy RPGs, one of which might be called Dungeons & Dragons, um, are substantially different experiences than an old school exploratory game or an old school game. Um, and five room dungeons just don't provide the same sort of room and opportunities that a larger dungeon does. Now there's of course a, a time and a place for them. Um, typically what happens is you start in town, something's going on, you investigate a little bit. Oh no, there's a bad guy, he's got a lair, you go to the lair. You fight a couple things, go kill him, right? So I get it, there's an arc there. I just don't think it's very satisfying. And then just uh, to keep going on the whole dungeon design part of it is uh, multiple levels and multiple ways to get down oh. or up. Sure, and I think we're talking mostly about mega dungeons here. Yeah. Um, but when you're talking about a mega dungeon, I think um, you're looking for multiple ways in and out of the levels multi-level stairs, slides, things like that. Uh, in fact, even in, let's say, our five-room dungeon, right, having alternative entrances, a chimney, uh, a cave-in, something, a hole that you can dig through, digging out the top of the hill, um, I think alternatives to getting in um, are a great kind of, I don't know, uh, naturalistic mechanism for the party to explore. If it's a tower or a house, it's got a roof that we can tear off or windows on a balcony that we can go through or something. And that should be encouraged, not discouraged. Okay. Um, weird and unique magic items are a good thing. They are. Book magic items are boring. Um, so look, I'm not paying you to roll on a magic item table in the DMG and then tell me that it's plus one sword. I'm paying you as a designer to do more than that. And you can provide me a little bit of a description and some sort of unique effect. And in particular, an effect rather than a mechanism. I don't, I'm not particularly interested in mechanics, uh, but what's it do? It creates water on command or bile or something, right? Uh, it's much more interesting than, hey, it's a plus one sword, right? Now, you can take the things on the table and then add a little twist to them. I think one of the adventures I recently reviewed had a robe of scintillating colors in it, but it had been rethemed to like the Sea Queen's robe of anemones. Anemones? Um, which makes perfect sense, right, in that context. So they'd taken something normal out of the book and just twisted it a little bit, added their own color to it. And that's a great sort of thing to do. Uh, tricks and traps are a great thing. Tricks and traps are a great thing. So when we talk about dungeons, we're talking about interactivity, right? The various rooms have interactive elements. Um, the most common interactive element is just stabbing somebody. Uh, perhaps the second most common is talking to somebody. Two great elements. But then there's inter interactivity beyond that. And most dungeons, uh, not just OSR dungeons or adventures, could use um, a substantial uplift in that area. So we're talking about tricks and traps and pools of water that do things and statues with arms that you can pull and hidden flagstones and, I don't know, mirrors that you pass through, these sorts of things. Um, these all provide interactive room elements or adventure elements beyond the core of stabbing stuff and talking to stuff. Um, and that variety is extremely important. And what's your philosophy on, uh, say, like, I just interviewed Chris McDowell, and he talked about you basically just provide the information that there's a trap and let them figure it out. Do you, is that kind of a way that you like to approach it? Or do you like it to be like a surprise sprung trap 
Oh, no. So I don't like surprise traps. I don't like um, hallway traps in particular for that reason. I think they slow the game down. Somebody will disagree with me on that. But uh, what I like is when the DM gives the initial room impression to the players, there should be a hint in there. And clever players will follow up on that. So if there's rubble on the floor or the floor's cracked or something, a clever player will follow that up and figure out the floor is weak or something along those lines. The floor is blackened. Well, why is it blackened? Let's figure that out before we go running into the room and trigger the fire trap, right? So um, I think at the core of this is the back and forth between the DM and the players, right? So as the DM, you want to provide a little bit of information. The players follow up on that, ask you more questions. You then provide more information. They follow up more, and eventually they figure out what's going on and potentially how to use that to their advantage in the dungeon. Okay, and then this goes into the uh, layout part of it. Boxed text is usually not a good thing. Um, so boxed text is difficult. So boxed text, read aloud words. Um, I think my position on that has softened quite a bit. I realize that people are going to do it. Um, but I think it's relatively difficult to write good box text. I think it's difficult to write good evocative text in general. I think that's the hardest part of adventure writing. Uh, and then certainly aiming that at the players, I think it's harder. Um, so yeah, I've changed a little bit on that. I've lightened up a little bit on it. I recognize people are going to do it. Um, but I still think it's a very difficult part to do. And, and I'm going to jump down and then we can go back because you just mentioned evocative atmosphere and terse writing style. So how important is that for the DM or the reader to, to mm. work with? No readers. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll talk about the terseness, right? So in general, um, all of these get to all of these design elements we're talking about get to kind of three core elements. The adventure needs to be written and formatted for the DM at the table, right? And terseness gets to that. Purpose of the adventure is to be run by the DM at the table. The DM needs to be able to scan the adventure at the table. You don't scan two pages of text that are written in paragraph form. So terse descriptions help the DM uh, understand it. Uh, integrate it more into their framework, rock it more if you're into that author, um, and help them absorb the information and locate the information easier. However, at the same time, um, you need to be able to provide an evocative environment. Um, and this gets to the wandering monster thing we talked about earlier. It needs to have enough detail in it that the DM is excited about running it, or the DM's imagination takes over and then fills in the details. So ideally, we're talking about a sentence or two that's easily scannable. And then the DM's brain takes that and it runs with it, right? And then when the DM is talking to the players interactively, they're filling in more things from their own imagination. So the designer is using that to leverage the DM's imagination to provide even more information to the party. So, um, it needs to be both terse and evocative, a difficult thing to do. So do you prefer bulleted lists rather than box tests, texts? I prefer bulleted. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure I have a preference, right? Um, there are a thousand different ways to do these things. I think some formats are perhaps easier for beginning designers to use than others. But ultimately, I don't think it matters. As long as you can get your point across the DM in a terse, or I, I won't even say terse, in a method that allows them to absorb it quickly and is still evocative, then you've succeeded at being useful at the table to the DM. Think about running a room from an adventure. You're going to glance down. The party's going to go in a new room. You're going to glance down at that. You've got maybe two seconds, maybe, to read something before you need to look up and start interacting with people, or people are going to start pulling out their cell phones, right? You're not being interactive with the party. You're taking two minutes to read this thing. I'm not hanging around for that. I'm checking my email. What's my girlfriend telling me, right? Um, so you glance down for a couple of seconds. You need to absorb something, look back up, and start to interact with the players. And while they're bitching to each other and trying to figure out what to do, you're looking down to absorb the next batch of information, right? That's kind of how things run. 
So the way you do that doesn't matter as a designer, but you need to keep that in mind, right? Your information needs to be kind of conducive to that mechanism. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, dungeons should have a quantity of empty rooms and, and some unguarded treasure. So this comes from like old school D and D uh, mechanics, and it's certainly applicable to those. I'm not sure how applicable it is to modern dungeons. I think most of my advice is um, applicable across genre, Call of Cthulhu, space opera, whatever. This in particular, though, um, applies to older school games, particularly exploratory old school D and D games, where you need kind of a pacing mechanism. You need buffer rooms between monster zones and so on, and empty rooms provide that. And when we say empty, we don't always mean literally an empty room, but just a room with no creatures in it, nothing really going on. So going back maybe to the analogy of like maybe a movie or something like that, like after a heavy action scene or a heavy dramatic scene, you need some comedic relief or just something different to just kind of cleanse the palate? Right. It's a pacing issue, right? Okay. Plus, the party needs some place to rest. Uh, pools, statues, etc., that do strange things. So this gets back to um, the interactivity element, right? You need elements in the dungeon that aren't just stabbing and talking to people. Uh, and in particular, pools and statues are traditional classical elements, both in classical D and D and in folklore, right? I grew up with stories. Of secret doors behind bookcases and chandeliers that fall and these sorts of things. Put in some of that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. And non-standard monsters. Oh, and so this is, um, again, this gets uh, similar to the non-standard magic items. Um, one of the elements that I think is greatly overlooked in a lot of role-playing games is the element of fear for a player. Uh, when you meet a new monster, you don't know what it does. You don't know what its attacks are, what its defenses are. Is it going to shoot fire at you or spit acid? Is it going to level drain? Um, and by introducing new monsters to the players, you spark that element of fear again, right? After 50 years, everybody knows what a troll does and what a goblin does and what an orc does. Retheme something. Make something new. Right? There are plenty of resources for that. Uh, it'll scare the players shitless, which is always a wonderful thing. Right, One of the best things you can do as a DM is have the players always apprehensive about what's going on. If the party is certain, there's a problem. And foreshadowing the main villain. So this is kind of the Lareth the Beautiful problem from the village of Hamlet. You get to the end of the dungeon. Aha! I am the evil high priest, Lareth the Beautiful, and I was behind all of this shit. And then he gets, you know, he gets aha out of his mouth and the party stabs him and moves on, right? Uh, he, <laughs> one of my goals as a player is to always kill the main bad guy before he gets a soliloquy in. I think that's the goal of many players. Um, but you want to provide something in the adventure to kind of build up your villain or your bad guy, if you have one. You want some heads on pikes. You want rumors of raided outlying villages or scenes of brutality caused by whoever it is, right? Uh, again, this gets to the context of the adventure, right? You want to build that up some. So when they finally get to the bad guy or the mini boss or whatever it is, they have some context to put it in. They have a, more of a relationship with them. And ideally, the players, rather than the characters, hate you, right? If you can motivate the players to go into the dungeon or look for the treasure or kill the bad guy, you've done substantially great work as a DM or designer, more so than just motivating the characters. Okay, uh, order of battle for humanoids getting help. So uh, pet peeve, right? You go into the cave, room one, get your torches lit, you stab something really loudly, the creatures in room two, 10 feet away, don't do anything. They just sit there and wait kindly for you to come in and stab them. Uh, this is stupid. Uh, particularly with intelligent creatures. Hey, you know, what do they do if 
they see light or Frank comes in yelling for help that the adventurers are here. This doesn't have to be complex. A paragraph will do. But help the DM prepare for the inevitable pitched battle situation, right? There's always a situation where the bad guys figure it out, right? This thing starts as a stealth mission. It turns into a pitched battle. Help the DM figure that out and who's reacting to the party in battle. And lots of vermin, animals, ooze, undead type of things in dungeons. So I love these things. Um, and again, this might be um, advice, particularly for an old school exploratory d d adventure. Um, but don't just rely on humanoids. Um, throw in some other vermin and some dungeon ecology. Spiders are a great thing. Giant spiders, oozes falling from the ceiling. All of these things are great. Throw in a little bit of it. Um, it gets boring when it's all the same sort of thing, right? And next is go light on humanoids or even replace them with normal bandits. And so again, humanoids, I think are generally misused in many games. They're used as a stand-in for humans. And I think when we instead use humans and bandits as the main bad guys in many of the adventures, particularly at lower levels, we then have the ability to use the humanoids much more effectively in a more bestial fashion. Uh, I was just re reviewing something where lizard men are eating somebody's brains out of their disembodied head with a silver spoon. Well, there's a reason to go kill that dude, right? That poor villager didn't deserve that. Um, other sorts of things like that, right? It allows you to portray this much more bestial opponent or a much more foreign culture um, and really use that effectively as a design and GM. Removing player ability or options is seldom a good thing. Oh, um, so I don't like it when designers gimp the party. Like you worked for your turn undead ability. You worked for your pass wall to have the designer then say, the wizard cast 192 wish spells, and now you can't use pass wall or stone to mud in the dungeon. It's just dumb. The party worked hard for these abilities. If you can't write an adventure that takes into account pass wall and stone to mud, then maybe you should be writing a lower level adventure, right? And then the, your last two bullets, and I'm going to combine them, is monsters should be doing something, not just always sleeping and guarding, and factions are a very nice thing to have. So um, this, again, gets to interactivity and evocative nature of the dungeon, right? You want it to seem like a more naturalistic place. So I think the classic example is you go into a room and they're playing cards or something at the table or shooting dice, right? Um, this provides a little more variety. Again, right? monsters aren't just waiting around waiting to be back. Um, and then factions allow for more role-playing opportunities in the dungeon. There generally are not a lot of role-playing opportunities in the dungeon, or in some dungeons there are not. Everybody's a crazed cultist who fights to the death, and that's kind of boring. Um, instead, by having factions, you can go talk to the orcs, and maybe they don't like the goblins either. Or you both kind of want to do something about that. Um, and it, provides for a little bit of moral ambiguity play, like how much are you willing to push here? How much are you willing to put up with, right? Um, and I should say, all of these tips, um, they've been on my website now for 10 years, 11 years now. Um, I've taken them all now and I've started writing a book that expands upon them. Uh, you can find that book in the forum, kind of individual chapters and sections uh, on the 10 foot blog forum. Uh, there's a link, I think, to a Google Doc that has the actual book, but there are individual forum posts with a lot of discussion from the forum membership and so on. Still writing the book. It'll never get done. But it expands upon these topics and kind of coalesces them into kind of what I think these days about things. On the forum, do you get a lot of um, debate over some of your um, ideas or concepts, or do people kind of accept them as far as like, no, I think Bryce knows what he's talking about by now? So I think about 90% of it is pretty standard advice. And I should say, none of my advice is really genius advice. And I don't even think I came up with any of it. I think this is all pretty standard, either dungeon design advice, or let me rephrase that, adventure design advice, because I think the vast majority of it 
applies to any adventure for any system, um, but then particularly for dungeons and old school adventures, fantasy as well, um, it becomes even more relevant. And it's all pretty standard things, right? It's not revelatory information that I've come up with. Um, I've just collected it and perhaps coalesced it through the forge of a couple of thousand reviews um, into a more salient way of discussing it or uh, stating it. Uh, so I'd say about 90, 95% of it is pretty standard. Uh, and most of the rest comes down to simply being genre specific, uh, like empty rooms, uh, or people with personal preferences, uh, which I don't really care about. Everybody's got a personal preference. But again, I don't think these are my, I mean, it's going to be a point of debate. I don't think these are my opinions. I think this is essentially the stated opinion of the vast majority of designers, players, and DMs within the RPG community. It's just nobody's collected them before. People will diverge a little bit, but generally, yeah, this is what makes a good adventure. So when you see, see new uh, writers putting out their first uh, adventure or module or uh, thing like that, and all these items that you mentioned that are common, common practice now, like all your advice that you've collected over the years, it, do they just not do enough research often yeah. or like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so people don't know what a good adventure is. Um, you, you get into D&D, hey, this is great. I love it. Um, you're having a good time. You're trying to write something so other people can have a good time. You're trying to share your excitement and passion, right? But you got no idea what you're doing. Like at best, you see this stuff, this garbage stuff that Watson's putting out, or Heisio, or you know whatever for Pathfinder. Um, people don't know what a good adventure is. They don't know how it's formatted, so they're doing their best, right? And generally, I I kind of understand that. I get frustrated sometimes that people don't go looking for more information. But where are they going to find it? And it's hard to find. Um, so I kind of understand why they're bad. Um, and certainly I wouldn't discourage anyone from ever publishing their first adventure or whatever. Uh, but boy, do I really wish they were better. <laughs> so. And what's your view on um, you know, modules and then settings? Like from an aspect of like, say, like a city setting or something like that, where there's like NPCs that are like built into it and um versus like a sandbox where you can just wander around and like random tables and the the map essentially so i guess i don't really have a um th they're different things right so i don't have a strong opinion on them personally uh i really love city adventures uh i really love kind of the small local trouble that you can get into and uh, great NPCs and so on. Um, and sandbox adventures are great too, right? I love being able to go wherever and do whatever. Um, and in particular, a set of tables can help you kind of facilitate that as long as the tables aren't driving the adventure. When the adventure is generated off of a table, I get a little sad, but um, you know, you've got some wandering monster tables and you're doing like a hex crawl or something. I think that's great. So I don't really have a preference one way or the other. Um, I think they're both great, although, again, I kind of really like seeing the pictures. And now might be a good time to talk about, we previously, before the interview, we talked about OSE oh, and, some yeah. of their, and some of their concepts of how they structure their yeah. adventures. And can you just talk about like the stylistic choices that have been made? Because OSE is kind of top of mind right now for a lot of people as far sure. as... So the adventures, the house... So generally, I'm down on house styles uh, for adventure publishers. I think most of their house styles are really garbage. Um, OSC, though, Gavin, I think he's done a really great job with his house style. Um, he's using kind of a combination of bullet points and bolded words with parents to kind of create this sort of evocative list um, that doesn't really describe things in sentences or paragraphs. It more gives impressions to the DM. And I think that impressionistic sort of thing works very well for help, helping to load information into the DM's head that they can then riff on, their imagination rips on, and then sends out to the party. I think it does a fabulous job of that. 
Um, and I can honestly say it, it is the one house style that I think is um, really a standout style. Uh, I think that the format is chosen there um, is kind of difficult maybe for a new designer to use. It's easy to understand what they're trying to do, um, but maybe a little hard for a new designer to figure out what should I be bolding? What are the actual appropriate keywords for a room? What is the additional follow-up information and so on? Um, I think it's a little hard for a new designer to figure that out. Um, there might be other formats that are easier, but his, his own style with his own editors, I think it's absolutely a fabulous format. One of the best. And do you have a like a philosophy on how much of a role the DM has in in versus player and player agency uh, as far as when you structure your own adventures when you play? Player agency versus the DM. I think you're asking about the DM telling the story. Railroading versus, you know, all yeah, they can go to fucking hell. So um, yeah, I have a strong opinion on that. Okay. The DM's not telling the story. It's the player's story. The player agency is supreme here. Now look, they've got to work with the DM some, right? We're all human. I've only got so many hours in a week to prep for a game. You want to play D&D tonight or not, buddy, right? But the DM's not telling the story. Uh, it's the player's story. Uh, the DM is facilitating kind of a neutral tone. Um, and so it, it really kind of, I don't think it's D&D. I don't even think it's role playing when the DM tells a story. I think you don't have agency, you don't have a railroad. What you're doing is playing let's pretend and interactive storytelling sort of thing, which is great if you wanna do that. I think that's wonderful. In my own very, I don't know, strict jargon, I don't think it's a game. I don't think it's a role playing game. I think it's something else, but I know people are going to have opinions on that. It's a different thing. If you enjoy it, that's great. And uh, going back to your blog for a sec now, you did a four year project reviewing every single adventure from Dungeon Magazine. For those that might not know, Dungeon Magazine was prominent in the 80s and 90s and then uh, kind of died out, I believe. I don't even know what year it died out, but you went through the whole entire catalog of adventures in Dungeon Magazine as a sense of torture? Was that your, your process? Yeah, it didn't start out that way, but it quickly uh, migrated to that. So Dungeon Magazine is a terrible magazine. Uh, I know many of us, including myself, have fond memories of it. Uh, it was published, I don't know, monthly, bi-monthly, whatever. Uh, had a number of adventures in it. Um, it's where the first adventure paths showed up in like three uh, section adventures, three-part adventures. Um, but they were paying people by the word. And when you pay people by the word, people pad out what their adventure is. These things were not written for the DM to run at the table. Sometimes they had a good idea. Sometimes they had a couple of good ideas. Um, but very infrequently was there an actual good adventure in there, a really good idea that the DM could, should spend their time uh, expanding on, using highlighter on, taking notes on so that they can run, uh, or even more rarely in a format that was easy to run at the table. Uh, absolutely a dreadful magazine. I think it was published to read as the word magazine implies, right? And reading an adventure is different than running an adventure, right? Um, I don't think, in fact, that if you're reading, if you're writing an adventure to be read, we shouldn't call it an adventure anymore. It's something else. You can't publish it as something else because then nobody's going to buy it. They only buy adventures, right? Uh, but an adventure should be written to be run at the table. And those were not. And did at, in, at any point you just go, I don't want to do any, this anymore? Like, yeah, I'm gonna yeah but two or three times. Like, I think I quit for like a couple of months once halfway through it. And I was like, this is, I never want to play D&D again. I just want to burn everything to the ground. Uh, more often than, I mean, you can read the reviews and it's like, oh my God, I have to do this again. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, it's just the expectation that this is going to be garbage. And it was. <laughs> and another thing that you recently did on your blog was the Wavestone Keep Adventure Design Contest. So I review this adventure, Wavestone Keep. You should all go buy a copy of Wavestone Keep. 
Uh, it was not a good adventure, and I was feeling down that day. Uh, like, I don't think I reviewed a good adventure for a while. And so I was like, hey, I want you to use the marketing blurb, but you can't steal it. you got to rephrase it. I want you to use the core concept, but you got to change it a little bit. I want you to use the title, Reefs Don't Keep, but again, you can't steal it. you got to change it a little bit. I want you to write an adventure. The winner gets 100 bucks. And I got, I don't know, 25, 30 entries in it. I'm currently reviewing those entries uh, and will be for probably another month. Um, you can see the reviews on the blog. The entries are turning out to be pretty fabulous. Um, turns out that the readers of the 10 Foot Mole blog are educated, fine people, uh, who have the best taste in adventures. Um, and uh, we're getting some really high quality stuff with some interesting concepts out of them. I know uh, I saw one comment on your most recent review and they were saying like, how can these are all so good because, and I, you just answered that, like they've been picking up tips and tutorials on how to make adventures. Right. So surprise the people that care about adventure design, write good adventures. And where do you see uh, like adventure design going? Cause one of the questions I have for you is, has it all been done before? Like, is there any new adventures to be had? Cause it, after almost how many years that D and D's been out, like there's been a lot of ground covered. So, I mean, good point. Um, you know, some people will say you never need another orcs in a hole adventure. That's been done. It's been done well enough that you don't need to do it again. Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I I enjoy kind of rehashes of adventures. I think we're getting great new stylistic and formatting. Uh, layout ideas coming in from like the Morkborg and Troika crowd. I think they have work to do on actually knowing what an adventure is, but kind of the publishing stuff that they're doing is very exciting. Sort of new school art punk stuff, um, because it's not new school anymore. Um, it's been out for a few years. I think they have some interesting ideas. Um, so I still think we're continuing to see great new things come out and fresh takes on older things. So um, Castles in Tillian by Gabber Lux, um, you know, probably the best adventure ever published just a couple of years ago and a great example of what an od and adventure should be. Um, so I think there's still lots and lots of room. High level adventures in particular, I don't think there's been a lot of looking into what that is, both in traditional dungeon kind of high level adventures or I've got a stronghold now, or I control a hex or a group of hexes as the local lord. That sort of thing I don't think has been explored very much at all. Uh, hex crawls, not a lot of interest there. I mean, a little bit more, but not a lot. Uh, and even traditional dun dungeons, right? We're always looking for something new. We're going to spend our money on something. Lots of room. So just before we wrap up, what would you advise uh, somebody that is in that position where they say, hey, I love Dungeons and Dragons. I want to pass along my passion by doing my first adventure design. What should they do? What's their first step? Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a hard one. Um, so if you want to write, you should write. Man. Like, if, if you want to do it, you should do it. And you should tell people like me to just go fuck off, right? Um, but if you want to do a good one, <laughs> right, then um, Try to find an example of what some good adventures are and don't go to the places you normally go to. So if you're playing Pathfinder, don't go to those forums and try to figure out what a good adventure is. Go to other places and try to figure out what a good adventure is. Get ideas from outside of the genre that you are writing for, the system that you're writing for, and try to figure out what actually makes those good. Um, of course, Tin Football is there. The Adventure Design Forum is there along with the book draft which is probably in more than good enough shape to learn from. But try to figure out what a good adventure is. And I don't mean from a pacing standpoint, or you need three encounters, and then a talkie encounter, and then a boss fight. Like, that's all garbage, right? Nobody gives a shit about that. What we care about is an adventure that's easy to use, and evocative writing, and interactivity in the dungeon. So you want to find adventures that do that, so you can see, oh, this is what they mean when they say 
a scannable text or a well-written text that's easy for the game to absorb. This is what actual evocative writing looks like as opposed to flowery novel writing, right? Or second person, third person writing, um, first person writing. So finding examples of these things is what you should be doing if you want to write a good adventure. Well, I really appreciate you sharing a bit of your wisdom and uh, your history with us today. And uh, I know a lot of designers are going to probably be reviewing template templatepoll.org on a regular basis. And um, also if people want to be ignored, obviously they can sign up for your Patreon and support your efforts to raise the quality of adventure design. And uh, I just want to say, uh, Bryce, thanks for joining me today and uh, keep up the good work on templatepoll.org. Uh, thank you for having me. I will ignore your advice to keep up the good work and I will continue to drink and drown my sorrows. <laughs>